Welcome to Ask Miss Mears, where we answer your most burning questions and solve your most nagging problems. I won't always know the answer, but I'll know someone who will. If we are what we wear, the resurgence of the use of our indigenous fabrics in our clothing, accessories, and housewares in the last decade or so is very good news indeed, not just for our recognition and pride in our national identity, but also in support of our ethnic groups craftsmen and artisans in helping keep these traditional creations alive. To help us harness our Pinoy pride to its full potential by learning about our national cultural heritage through our fabrics, our Habi Textile Council members, Rambi Lim of Ancestral Crafts and Charisse Tugade of the Manila Collectible Company and founder of Culture Aid. Please welcome Rambi and Charisse. Hello. 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 Hi. Wow. I love the fabrics behind you. Care to tell us what those are? Um, oh. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for having us. Um, I have um, Pinacol, um, which okay. is Pinabel, um, right. mostly done in, um, in Locos Norte. Um, and then I also have some pieces from, um, from Kiangan. So, Ikat, uh, sorry, Ikat, <laughs> Ikat weaves. <laughs> From Yifugao. Right. right. And uh, on, on my end, um, <laughs> we have a modern take on Inabal. So this is the textile um, Bagobo backstrap loom. So the, the indigenous group that crafts this, um, they're a Bagobo group from Bansalan, Davao del Sur. Traditionally, they use abaca, which is the wild banana plant um but now they're trying uh and experimenting on doing their ikat in cotton so this wow. is one of the samples we have and it's it's just very soft beautiful cotton with a tra uh, kind of traditional designs in the right. middle panel but colors on the side right how about me i am wearing something from your shop but i don't know what the fabric is called do you want to can you identify? oh wow <laughs> oh thank you thank you for wearing <laughs> thank you um, that's inaul and inaul is a traditional textile magindinaon and iranun textile and this is what they use to make malong oh okay how about behind me you know oh, that's <laughs> that's finally and from um okay. local store from uh, yeah it's um it's amazing <laughs> how well you know your fabrics and hopefully by the end of today we will uh imbibe just a little bit of your know-how as well i'm also wearing philippine cotton earrings from yahang yaha barter and i'm really uh, a philippine cotton convert ever since i tried uh wearing philippine cotton i i have to say it's really cool and really really fresco and cotton is something also that hubby is uh working towards um propagating, propagating. reviving right. <laughs> reviving and propagating yeah. so first of all uh, tell us something about yourselves and hubby and how you got involved um, so Habi um, was started in 2009, um, where um, a group of women, mainly um, Mrs. Mrs. Ongpin, um, Ruby Roa, and Elida Lim, they got together and they decided to to set up a, a textile council to to support. And this was uh, following the the second ASEAN textile symposium, where th there were so many women from uh, different parts of of the ASEAN. And then they came and they saw the, the importance of having a, a textile council. So I was with Habi from the beginning. 
Um, and it's wonderful to see the reach that Habi has gone um, with the Likang Habi Textile Fair, um, the projects, um, the books, and, um, and also um, the trips that we've been able to go visiting the community of weavers in the Philippines. And how about you, Charisse? So I've been, I was involved with Habi, I guess, towards the middle <laughs> a couple years ago. And, you know, Habi, it, it's such a great community because um, it, there's a lot of research that goes into uh, to doing this kind of work and this advocacy that we do and a lot of just heart, you know, it's really pure heart. So you have a lot of the, the, the our board members. Um, Tita Marbelongkin and Mam Adelaide Lemon. They're just doing really great work. And we have now, we will have a book, another, I think, our third publication. And this right. will be um, available in a week, in a week or so. Right. And yes. this is by uh, Miss Norma Restisho, textile expert, and by Gail Zialcita. So that's something that we're looking forward to so we can really educate the wider public about our textiles, about the groups that create these beautiful textiles. Um, well, yeah, so every year we usually have a fair, but this year it's, an, it's a different type of fair and it's very exciting and we will talk about it later, I believe. Right, right, right. <laughs> so both of you own uh, shops or businesses uh, using indigenous textiles and maybe you want to tell us about your businesses and how Habi uh, helps you with your business and other entrepreneurs who deal with textiles? Um, so yes, we live a very textile-centric <laughs> life. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I started with um, Ruruan Sitabud Foundation, which, um, which is actually non-traditional. What, um, what happened was we were able to find um, the pineapple needed for piña weaving. Um, it was growing abundantly around Puerto Princesa, Palawan. Um, so that with um, uh, coupled with uh, a program of the uh, sorry, DTI and uh, Phil Fida, we were able to, um, to, to bring in master weavers from Maklan um, to teach a group of weavers, um, a group of non-weavers actually, um, in Puerto Princesa. From that initial group of 10 weavers, we, we've been able to expand. Um, and um, in that line, that this was in um, 1999, um, and as it's expanded, we've also branched out to um, other textiles um, and other forms. Um, I also, um, with um, with my aunt, um, I'm working with Ancestral Crafts, which is a, um, a division of the foundation where we work with traditional communities and help them to develop their products so that it is it stays relevant in in this. Um, day and age. So Ancestral Crafts is now supporting Caneo weavers. Caneo weavers are from Bontoc. Um, the group of weavers we're working with are based out of Baguio, but they're they're um, working to to maintain and revive um, their weaving traditions. They mostly weave in pure cotton now, and which is fantastic. So most of our products will be at the at the Likang Habi Fair on right. the 20th. Right. And for you, Therese? So on, on my end, um, I run an NGO called Culture Aid. And what we do, we, we um, leverage indigenous knowledge to empower indigenous communities around the world. So we are around the world, around the Philippines. So, so we do documentation, research, things like cultural mapping. Um, we provide funding and um, whatever the community needs, we, we kind of just work with that and kind of, okay, if we see kind of like um, something that they're, they're really good at and they're not leveraging or, you know, um, then, then we kind of hone that. So um, we, we run um, a weaving center, the Iranun Weaving Center, and we do get our cotton from Habi um, because Habi really promotes all of this, um, this uh, our Philippine cotton. So we get cotton right. and then we weave um, with the Iranun community in Sultan Kudarat. So they weave the malongs now. Um, and we, right. we just work with different communities, Bagobo, Ifugal, um, different ethno-linguistic communities. And then our marketing arm is Manila Collectible. Oh. So 
space in intramuros and that space just has it's all sorts of different things not only textile but what we are um very grateful for is that habi gave the manila collectible a platform to uh, and kind of a wider audience in a wider reach so so um now because of habi's intervention i would say and just all the help that they've given us um we have more people that know about our work and right. are know about all these other entrepreneurs uh, designers and indigenous groups that are really trying to push their textiles and um educate the wider public about who they are and what their community is about right and what we flash on the screen now is the map of the country with all the weaves, indigenous weaves that belong to each region. And as you can see, every part of the map, there's really yes. like an indigenous weaving tradition. Uh, so part of educating everyone on our show in the country and on our show today, we're going to talk about the top five things every Filipino ought to know about Philippine traditional textiles. And let's start with traditional textiles 101. Here's, here are some of the weaves that might be familiar to everyone. And we don't know what they're called, but we ought to know what they're called and where they're from. And you're gonna teach us today. Uh, first of all, what can you say about this variety of 12 we've shown here today are they all from different regions or they're, they've yeah. all been around yes. since ancient times tell us something about these weaves um so is it okay if i start um the you know the oldest textile discovered in the philippines is the, an ika textile okay and ika is uh, right here. is tie dye. So if you're familiar with like a tie dye shirt, right? Yeah. So usually when you craft a tie dye shirt, you have to um, you know, you put the rubber band. You have a ready made shirt, and you put the rubber bands, and you dip it in whatever dye. The with ikat, you tie dye the individual threads. Okay. Wow. So you got you have to tie dye. So imagine a loom. Let's say it's like twenty four inches. You put like a thousand pieces of thread, whether it be a baka or cotton or pinya, and you need to knot it, right? And you need to make a specific design so that it's like triangles or whatever shape that you want. And you have to replicate it horizontally and vertically, and then you dye it and all of that. So these are our oldest textile traditions. Um, uh, well, where was the, the oldest one? I think it's Romblon. Oh my goodness, I forgot. My brain's not working anymore. But um, <laughs> this these Ika traditions, you'll find it in still in Ifugao, but you'll find the traditional abaca um, made by the Tiboli in Blaan and the, these and Mandaya and Bagobo and Subanin. Pero Subanin nawawala na siya. So ma makikita niyo like on the bottom left i don't know if that's left or right bottom left this one <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> and then uh, on the other side as well you'll see the ikat designs okay this one yeah. right when you say old how old is old oh the the oh um uh, a couple of hundred years old uh even I before will... the spanish came yes definitely. yeah yeah uh oh yeah. right, right. uh oh um because we had to wear clothes right we were wearing clothes <laughs> upon, <laughs> right? like people were like oh are you like nakabahag no we had we were we had right we, right we, had, we were already trading we had all of these different uh, materials already right what about these other ones there's the yeah. pinili, pinili and pinili weaving ilocos norte the blue one yes. Um, that's like, like um, by the same group as the blanket behind you. Um, and then oh, there's okay. also the one below um, is the binacol, like the one behind me. Um, the interesting thing about the binacol is um, it is said to be, um, they use it for the sales of the galleon ships. 
Okay. Um, and then the binakwal is it's op art, but it's also um, they also do it in the patterns of wind. So even the the names of the different patterns of the binakwals are are wind. Um, the, so there's that abanico, which is like right. a fan, um, and then the kosikos, which is um, like a whirlwind, which is actually like this one. Okay. It's wow. It's very psychedelic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this one binakwal. Okay. What about? Yeah. This Kalinga weaving. Kalinga, it's a, a mix of, so they have a, a plain weave and then they, they also do a lot of embroidery and beading on, on the pieces. So um, traditionally they would weave um, in between harvest um, and then after they've woven um, the next couple of seasons, they, they do the embroidery on it. So shells, um, which were traded because right, there, there's right. no shells up in, the, uh, up in Kalinga. Um, mm -hmm. And then also like um, there, like the use of silk was also something that was um, done trading with the Chinese and and the the Moros um, during right. um, Spanish time. Um, Pina yeah. itself um, is said to have been like developed or pushed forward during um, the Spanish colonization of the Philippines. Uh, that's where it, it sort of um, brought about its its popularity, um, and it, it's been able to. To hold still because of um because it's what we use for formal wear right um yeah and pi the piña fabric is uh unique to the philippines is it yes 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 right it is. Yeah. and you also have uh for the this year's have the fair uh piña competition is that right yes so we have the third um the third lourdes montanola piña weaving competition where we um we ask piña weavers to to send in um their pieces and um so so at the moment it's still uh, it's still a mix of traditional and um and modern um right. but what we've been seeing in the past couple of years is that um, there's a resurgence of um uh older techniques that haven't been in the haven't been put out in a while and then they're they're they're, they're bringing it they're bringing it back because the thing about the pina weaving competition is they have to all be newly woven oh Okay. This is also to show what the capabilities of our, our current weavers are, um, right. what they can do and, and how they can explore. Because part of it is also um, trying to find an innovation of, in design and maybe also in, in the way they, they produce the fabric. Right. What can you say about this Saputangan Pibiakan headdress from Basilan? I love all the pinks, all the right. shades. Yeah. Pink. <laughs> so these are woven using um, a backstrap loom, um, and the backstrap loom is very, very. It's you can bring it anywhere. You can literally. It's a, a couple of pieces of wood and your thread, and you can weave it anywhere. And what's cool about these these textiles is they're woven backwards, right? So oh. the design underneath once you you weave them and um it's it's still very intricate and it's done a lot of the really really beautiful work is done in basilan and a lot of the weavers some have moved to zamboanga so you see beautiful work from those areas as well um there's also a lot of modification well and traditionally they would use this very this not tradition. I mean, tra okay. What is traditionally? So let's say like thirty years ago or forty years ago, they would use a, a kind of mercerized thread, and then now you see a move uh, toward polyester because polyester is more durable. Um, but then now, within the last five seven years, they're going back to cotton because cotton is is presco. It's difficult yes. to, to use polyester or super presco, right? Would you say that there are color palettes that are unique to certain regions? I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like in Mindanao, they're more colorful. And maybe in the north, they stick to neutrals. Is that a valid observation or not really? Um, I think it's also it's diff different, different. So um, textiles are, are based on, um, we use them for identity. Um, and then so in, in this identity, we also have different um um different i think tears no right, um, a right. lot of them in the now especially like the yellows um 
that's um that's that's um what's that royal colors oh so there's like for, a co color coding yes yeah. like um so like in oh. the Ifugao, they use a lot of black but that's mostly for the warrior blankets um okay. uh the red um in in like for the binacol a lot of it was also um indigo indigo dyes okay indigo was something that we produced also at a certain level during i guess in the like 30, 30 50 years ago but it's slowly right. um it slowly died down um right. but but indigo was something that they would also put into the crop so in between planting cotton they would plant indigo because indigo had um a lot of nitrites in it and then it right. would um it would nourish the 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 soil so they could when soil. they planted cotton again or rice right. Right. it would be richer right different different what about this hablon Kinirai uh, and Hiligaynon in from Panay Island. This, this okay, that's a patajong. Okay, I, I believe. Um, yeah. Would you say it's like our native plaid? Yes, it would native be plaid. native plaid. Ah, uh, okay, um, yeah. Could you say so that? The, so the yeah. patajong, naman, it it was um it's. Of all the, the, the textiles that are um, on on the board, um, it is the it's more the this one. Uh, it's more of the normal day. Okay, um, daily wear. wear. Yeah, day, daily wear. Where others like the 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 sepetangan headdress and then okay. the pishabit, um, they're more um, used for ceremonial um, okay. uh, purposes. Yeah, and if they're yeah, yeah. Or if you're wow. a kind of like a the, yeah. I know. So the patajong and the malong are the same thing. Okay. It's just called the malong when you're in Mindanao, but it's it's right. worn pretty much the same. Oh, okay. isn't the patajong shorter? Oh yeah, a little bit shorter. It's yeah, shorter. shorter. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit shorter. So it's more like a skirt. While the malong can be a dress. Okay. We're gonna show those uh, clothing styles in a bit. Uh, for all the viewers, I'm gonna post this. Uh, fabric infographic on my Facebook page. So you can take a look there. And now we go to indigenous clothing styles, starting with the uh, tapis. Would you like to tell us about the tapis? Um, the tapis is I know, it's mostly um, worn. Um, so it's like the patajong and the malong for, for, the, for Luzon. Oh. Um, so it's usually about, um, I think, about two and a half to three meters right. long, and then about a um, meter and a half wide. So it's it's a it's a cover it's a skirt, and it's also like for this one this photograph it's a it's a cover of a dress so that um, you could be more modest also because like oh. the different like the the one underneath it's a little bit flimsy and thin okay. so you usually okay. put a tapis over it so that um it covers and and you're um you're more uh what's it called um right. covered <laughs> because um, <laughs> the 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 tapis is also something that was um that uh that identifies people from different um areas there's this exhibit in baguio in the uh, cordillera Museum, uh, Museo Cordillera, where they have um, tapices from different um, different groups. The Kalinga tapis is, is different from the Ifugao tapis, wow. and different from the Gadang, and 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 they vary from um, woven um, woven design to also embroidery and beading. Right. This one here is a malom, is it, or also a. Are these malongs? Or? These, these are malongs. Okay, okay, these are malongs. All right, next we have the bahag with a blanket. Yeah. Uh, here's a very it, old photograph from the north. Uh, the, the, the first one was Ifugao. Um, this one, I'm not sure. The next one. Right. So this uh, red and black color palette seems to be very popular in Ifugao. Is there, would you know if there's like a specific reason or does it indicate 
also a certain social standing or yes their their patterns do um i'm not particularly sure about in which level they yes but in in society your your um your your um standing right. is um it's, is identified in in your clothing right, um, right so they have colors um and then embroidery and then also um fabric combinations right okay this one is the malong also malong this is a malong too you were saying something about why this illustration is important uh, yes, this, this illustration is actually from the Boxer Codex. So they say that uh, Governor Dasmarinas, I mean, it's still kind of a theory. He had kind of had asked um, someone to, to do all of this kind of ethnography of, you know, the people from the Philippines. And you see these beautiful images. And this is just one of the many images. You have images of some balls. You have images of... Um, of the the people from the south this specifically is tagalog um kind of nobility right and um right. you'll find that their textile is you have the reds and you'll have the blues so red um we have um dyes that produce kind of this like red color right so it's a bark of a tree and you also have things like indigo so these are all natural dyes that were prevalent back in the day so this is like early 1600s right um right, right. so so this is kind of the the drapery that like kind of, oh, someone from the nobility would wear and you'll notice that they have all of this jewelry and that right, would traditionally right. be if you're from a, like a higher caste gold right and you see these leglets these are still worn today in parts of mindanao but they're not gold obviously they'd be like part of um i think it's like like a sort of vine Right, that they use right. on on their legs, and of course you see like a crest or some type of sword or dagger. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really cool document. You can find it at the University of Michigan, and you can download the actual codex. Oh wow! And is this available? yeah, and a lot of the online accessible online. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you can yeah. find it online. It's a, in University of uh michigan the their library there all right it's called the boxer codex mm -hmm. yeah so maganda to see like what, what what did our early textiles look like or how did people right. used to live and what were they right. what you know what was their jewelry even then charisse about the the one for the for the knees that that band around the knees yeah and it's supposed to be able to um to keep you strong no to protect oh. you to hold you up yeah. Oh, oh, and they also say there's also some that you can put on around your feet right not on your what's this on your ankle and that kind of wards away the snakes because usually it'd be like oh clink, clink, clink. <laughs> <laughs> so para golden leg weights oh, oh, the <laughs> compression and uh, para compression <laughs> garments so this one is still the malong yes um and do you know where it's from? Mranao. This is Mranao Malong, right? So you have, we will have um, vendors that are Mranao for the um, Habi Fair that will have this. They will have the traditional right. Malongs, right. right? With the Langkit and all of that, that design in the middle. And then they also have some modern versions. Great. Late, maybe later on we can do a show and tell so you can excite. <laughs> Next we have a patajong. Is this a patajong? Yeah. So Which this is also already in the, the Spanish time. Um, you see that she has the lighter blouse. So this could be um, uh, cotton. And then you see the evolution of the terno sleeve. So this is already uh -huh. the drop sleeve. Okay. Um, with the padajong, which which continued to be the uh, the underskirt um, during the Spanish time. How is the top different from the kimona? Um, so, but there's there's this this evolution. So, in originally when the Spanish came, um, uh, they would be with the the wrap skirts, and then they didn't have any any tops. So, oh, cool. um, to go with modesty, um, it started with um 
like like a polo with a, uh, a thinner sleeve and then okay. the sleeve would would evolve i think right, and right. It, i don't know if it was something that was like in tune with what was happening in europe but right. you have the bell sleeve the drop sleeve um right. and then towards um i think the 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 40s and the 50s and that's when they started to have the structure for for right. the the butterfly sleeves right. and the tear you know, was because they were it was in pieces it wasn't just one thing that you put on the sleeves right, right. were were um were different and then you had a kimona base right and right. Then, then you had the the panuelo and then you also had another one for the skirt like an overskirt right so it was like right. several pieces that's why it was there not so you had to put everything together so these skirts as well are but the drums yeah with uh drop oh, but they're not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the patajong fabric made na into a skirt oh um, okay. the patajong is a circular skirt so like a malo oh, it, okay. it's a tubular skirt that right. you just pick up and then you fold right right so traditionally did they just like uh wrap it around the waist and then uh roll it. how did they hold it up before safety pins <laughs> <laughs> there, well, there are several things there. <laughs> go, go to these. Yeah, so it could be a wraparound or it could be a tube skirt. Um, oh, okay. This is a, not just Filipino, huh? This is, this is very Southeast Asian. Right, so you right. see the ties they have it in Indonesia and Malaysia. So this is kind of a quintessential Southeast Asian garment, garment that yeah. we used to have back in the day, we still have now. And some would be a wrap around, like a it's just a long piece of fabric that they wrap and then they tie right. it a certain way so it won't fall. Or it could be um, fastened by a belt. Um, right. And then the malong, there's certain ways that you can um, wear it where it doesn't fall. So, right. um, yeah. So these are these patajongs or there's a tapis on top of a patajong? I think this is a tapis. Okay. Tapis, it's also a tapis. Yeah. Right. And then we go to the barong. How come this, is there a difference between a barong Tagalog and are there other kinds of barong that are not Tagalog or it's just barong? Um, right, the barong and then I think the barong Tagalog, I am, I'm not sure um, how, how right. it is. Um, but it could also be like it was in, because the barongs, the barong material, the piña material is mostly woven in the Visayas, mostly right. in Aklan right. Right. and Iloilo, um, mm -hmm. and some some also in Negros. Um, but then, a lot of the embroidery was done in in Laguna and in okay. Manila. Okay. Um, at the same time, though, during the Spanish time, there was a lot of embroidery schools. Oh, um, cool. it was part. It was part of the part. the ladies' education. So every wow. lady in the household would know how to do the embroidery. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what distinguishes a piña barong from other kinds of barong? Um, well, I guess the one. <laughs> is it cooler or harder to make or? I'm not sure. Uh, finer maybe or more special because like how long uh does it take to weave a piña fabric i heard it takes a very long time the, the process of of like completing a, a piña piece is actually quite long because um a lot of it is you um they get the fibers from from the pineapple plant and then they scrape right. it um, and then when you get it, you get it from the leaves. No? And then the leaves are about a, a meter long if, if, if you're lucky. Um, and then from that, they have to knot it. So there's a splicing method and then there's right. a knotting method. Um, and that's where then you can spool. For a pure piña barong, um, they use two types of um, pineapple fibers. Um, they call it the bastos and then the liniwan. The bastos is the thicker um, fiber which um which they use for the warp and then right. the lini one is the, the a more delicate fiber that they use for the weft um in terms of embroidery they some use pineapple some use silk um and then some use um uh threads that are 
the color is uh, is close to 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 the textiles. Um, I think the barong itself was is is the. So I remember my grandfather used to have a lot of linen barongs. So, oh yeah, right. So the barong is sort of like the businessman suit, I guess. Right. And then right, right. senior barong would be like the upgrade, which was for um for formal occasions. So, yeah. Yeah, for right. wedding. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So I don't know if the perception still pervades that sometimes people will say, why should I buy our indigenous weaves and products when it costs more than uh, non-indigenous weaves? Maybe you want to tell us exactly what kind of work goes into it and what kind of... Uh, rationale um, okay. there is about so um you know there uh what what we ultimately want to do is ensure that there is fair trade right right and a lot of the weavers right. um let's say um when you weave tinalak you so just think of a meter they weave less than that in a day like half a meter in one day right, right? before they weave right before you weave you have to uh, ensure that first you get the cotton or abaca you have to there there you go so that you you have to get the threads whether it be pinya or abaca then you have to lay them down you sometimes you have to dye it and that takes some time to do right and you need there's a whole process before you do the actual weaving right the weaving is actually the easiest part it's just the setting up and you know spooling and doing all of these things with with a with the threads and then you actually have to weave it and when you weave it you can't weave so much in a day right even if 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 you're mobilis you, you can weave like a, a meter or a yard um, but it also depends on the kind of design that you're doing so it's really just like a labor of love and with weaving for example if you are weaving items that are heavily with heavy design you need to be very good with your math all right. right. So let's oh, say wow. you leave kind of, under, and then yeah, math. It's it's all math, right? Um, so um, and counting and just making sure that the designs are on point. So it it takes some time, and um, you know, if we are able to pay all of these like thousands of pesos for all of these imported textiles right. or imported craft, how come we're not spending that on our own, right? When right. we know that. Okay, if I let you you buy six yards and it's like one hundred per yard. So how about the person that wove the item? You're going to pay them one hundred pesos for the day. It's it's not right. fair. Um, right. so we really try to in hobby, you know, look at you know the pinaka fair fair trade sustainability is like a huge thing. Um, and you know there are people that you know there you can't help it there are other people that really like make it so expensive when it shouldn't be as expensive as it, as it is but it is a little bit pricey and also you have to note and i think people should kind of look at this in a you know look at it in the macro level we only have about five thousand weavers in the entire country right, right. all right and we have as opposed to like thailand or india where they have like 100 times more weavers than we do so of course if you have that much weavers they already have the techniques on how to to do certain things and there's just more so they can really i know the price but here you know we really have to like closely guard um a lot of these communities and just make sure that you know they're even wanting to weave you have groups like um sabanin um i met one of the last weavers na so so you know if people are clamoring about the price or whatnot you just look at the work that goes into it right, right. so this is why we have this and we're super mm -hmm. appreciative of you just having us here to, to talk about it <laughs> and another, mean, the, go ahead, okay. go ahead. another go ahead. factor of of i don't know if price but it's also the difficulty to to have the fabric um because because one of it is like the materials sourcing of the materials um, for for a while there was no cotton in the market so right. that's why where people were weaving in uh, weavers were weaving in polyester um, and even abaca and then piña it is actually quite difficult to process the mm -hmm. the, the threads um, 
as well as the their circumstance where the weavers are um they the weavers are not in the city centers they're not actually um easily accessible by by logistic uh, logistic companies like JRS or, or LDC, so they're 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 further out um, to, to get them to be interested in weaving, to get them to have the material. That's that's actually quite difficult, um, and getting it to the market as well. Um, a lot of the price points um, have um, have are when it gets to the consumers, the, the customers are quite high, but it's not necessarily. Um, because of, of, of the cost from the weaving, it's also the cost of the middleman and getting it to right. the market. Right, um, right. So, so it's also important to, to know where your textiles are coming from and who wove it because that gives you a better appreciation right. of the, the fabric. And also, um, it, 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 it heightens its value and it makes it worth it. Right. Um, I think it's 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 also personal, like our willingness to to partake and and, and to support um, right. is is a big factor in in all of it. Right. How have have these efforts helped these five thousand weavers and help prolong the traditions? I can imagine that is it the case where the younger generation is no longer interested in weaving, or is it a matter of just making it enticing for them. Before Habi was started, um, at the at the sim, um, at the the second ASEAN textile symposium, um, Adelaide Lim uh, had gave a talk on um, on weaving in Bangar. Um, Bangar is in La Union, and and traditionally they they used to have um, a weavers market on market day, which is on a Monday, a whole basketball court. Um, of of weavers selling their wares. Um, when we went to visit in 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 two, 2009, there were about two or three um, weavers na lang selling. Um, and then wow. then th that was a problem that they everybody was much older. But as Habi um, started and then with we started first with the Likhang Habi Fair and then we also wanted more education. So we 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 put out the first book, which is um. Which is this one? Right. right. Um, a journey through Philippine handwoven textiles. Um, there was more understanding, and then in a way, it also encouraged more weavers to weave. At the at in at that point, um, the 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 mindset of the weavers is like, why am I gonna teach my my daughter, my granddaughter, how to weave what when for? when yeah when it has no economic value to me? So right. so in a in a sense, it felt like. The weaving had already skipped generations, um, but in the past um, eleven years of Havi, we've seen a resurgence. We've seen a resurgence in interest in 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 handwoven textiles, and and when there's interest, then people get excited, um, right. and and now younger weavers are starting to to have interest. Um, right. Uh, last year, there was a in the for the Ibagyo festival, they had a backstrap weaving competition. Initially, they wanted it to be everybody young, like okay, no weaver um, above thirty. But then we saw that they saw that it was that was going to be really hard because um, even if there were weavers, they didn't have the um, the skill right. and and then the knowledge of weaving. Um, but through uh, competitions um, like that, and through the hobby fair, and and through the books, we're seeing that um, there is more interest. Like uh, uh, even for the um, pina weaving competition, we're seeing that, that there are entries for from younger um, younger weavers, which is heartwarming, actually. Good. Are they teaching uh, weaving and textiles in schools? In, there's um, something called the School of Living Traditions, and this is run by the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, where they engage the master, whether it be um, weaving or another craft or performance, to teach the younger students. And you'll see many of those around the country. And um, But that's al kind of like an alternative school. It's not within oh. the system. But I understand 
that it's um, TESTA and PTRI. They're already working on modules oh, to include weaving. Right. Right. So that's very exciting. Also on my end, I wanted to add that we have now more male weavers that oh, wow. weave malongs. Um, especially during COVID, we've had um, maybe like an extra 20 male weavers that, wow. you know, maybe helped your wife before. Yeah, but they're helping now um, because, you know, they weren't, especially in the beginning of COVID, they weren't really working and their kids were there. So all of them just, w they weave together. And, um, you know, it's not a traditional thing, but it's something that is happening and it's, it's it's very exciting to see all these young people. You see males. You'll see women that were um, OFWs that wove when they were younger. Then they left for abroad, um, and then they're coming back. And then another source of their livelihood is this weaving up. So in our center alone, we have about eight women that were OFWs that are not leaving anymore. They're staying at home with their family. Right right because you, you want to keep the family intact and you want to make sure that that um you know everyone's together and right. just you know promoting the culture living living it and um teaching teaching the youth so that's kind of you know i'm very grateful that hobby is there as a platform and you know if we if we need help like with our communities during especially during covid hobby was there in the front lines like okay what are we going to do to help these communities that are affected by the pandemic. Right. And this is the new book that you're launching or has it been launched already? It's um it's going to be launched um next oh. week. Um okay. leaving please. Um it's um so there's the more um it's a instructional on weaving um uh in the Philippines which was um by um Yale's Child Sita, and then also um, Norma Respicio is also um, uh, is also a part in it, and she talks about um, I think eight communities and and their weaving traditions. Right, um, you, it's wonderful. Yeah, the first two books also still available. Yes, uh, both books yes. will be available um, on online, and they're still available on our Facebook page and also on our website. Right. Um, so the first one is um is 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 more like um sort of a um, primer, yeah stories um uh and then we we wanted it um, digestible so so easy to read um but gives you um a view on textiles all over the Philippines I think it it um it spans about eleven communities in the Philippines then the second one which is Rara by Elmer Nochaseda. Um, is about mat weaving in the Philippines because oh. weaving is not just textiles; it's also oh, mat, yes. and then it's also part of basketry. Right, um, right. And so, so he went all over. He went to Base, he went to um, Palawan, um, the, the Jamamapuns, um, and then also a lot of parts of of Mindanao. Um, weaving is also part of um, sort of like our color tradition. Right, um right. weaving mat weaving and then right. and we're excited for this new book that's coming out and it's um it's actually something that that pushes the the education on weaving forward right hopefully they'll include it in like grade school curriculum right as part of our uh, tradition education in the, uh, cultural tradition education next Totally. We go to cultural appropriation. Very controversial. Uh, <laughs> first so visual is a. It's a Kadamba. bad. Oh, it's not uh, part. Of, is this part of this topic? Or well, not? Um, in a way, um, because I, I, what for me, um, I wanted to to talk about um, how. Um, the communities use use we have to understand how they use the textiles and how they right. use the, the the finishing processes um and and see how they do it and then in a way gain more knowledge so um like designers and and and, and manufacturers or even just hobbyists can can have a, a better understanding of of how to right. use it right so and what is because, what go ahead sorry what is this picture showing us? Oh, this is this is a traditional gadang bag with the beading. Okay. Yeah. 
Oh, that. but it's not appropriating naman. No. No, no. no? okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, next we have So this is a modern version. Um so this is um this is from Ifogao. It is done in Ikat. This is the wide eagle blanket. So this is a modern warrior blanket. Um this is a So this is this you can according to Marlon Martin of um Ifugao Nation this one you can cut up and make it to a dress it's not okay. it, it, it won't um offend it won't, it won't offend um the next one though is the warrior blanket so this 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 um this is this is the one that you you cannot cut up and you cannot um, turn into other things uh, other things because it has um cultural significance to um, to the Fugaos and, and to their rituals and to their hier hier hierarchy. Um, right. And this is one of the most controversial ones because this is the one pe people attach to more. Um, they they know more. Like a lot of people have been making mistakes with, with this, um, with the death okay. blanket. Um, the first photo that we showed at Wide Sprig, um, they, they said that it wasn't, it, it was, it could be used, and then this was done through a council of elders. So okay. they wove it, and then they brought it to the elders, and they had a discussion on, on what makes it a death blanket or a warrior blanket or okay. a ritualistic blanket. And elders said that this one, it, it isn't. But I wouldn't cut it up, though. It's so beautiful. Right, <laughs> right, right. What? Okay. With a lot of the, the appropriation issues now, I think it's really... If you are if you are interested in indigenous textile, um, just ensure that you know who who is selling it, and right. and you work with the community, um, and do your due diligence because right now, honestly, we're seeing some stuff that people say is from Mindanao or from Maranao or or whatever indigenous group, and it's not right. You mm -hmm. see a lot of things that are made, and it's like from. Indonesia or Malaysia right. um, and machine woven and machine woven and you'll also see and because people need to make money so whoever you buy from you just ensure that they're they're a good um source you know, they're a good source and do your due diligence just because someone says it's okay you can use this textile for this you ask another person you know and then you use there's the NCIP that you can ask there's the National Commission for Culture and the Arts um and all of the all of the towns they have their culture and tourism office, so you can ask them as well. Um, and then the elders, of course, it's important to consult. Um, it, it's kind of a big issue now because a lot of people don't do that. And right. you know, you just have to do just a little bit of research and right. going through like the hobby, reading the the publications of hobby, and. Um, and um, just going to the fair, looking through the website, you'll learn a lot, a right. lot about different um, textiles. And so what's the easiest way to do due diligence besides what you mentioned? Read Habi's information. Oh, <laughs> um, well, <laughs> there's no really, you know, if you really care about the community, there's no easy way. It's not right. something... Oh, this is a fabulous uh, not textile. If you see that it's something used, like uh, uh, you know, like um, that's kind of common, then I right. think you're safe. But there's certain things that um, a lot of the ikat ikat um, textiles na abaka. Uh, right. Many of those there are some sacred ones, and then there are some that aren't. So right. it's something that the the designer or whoever or the hobbyist they should just ask. Um, right. And if there's research out there. You can just look online. Um, right, right. Go to the library. Right. <laughs> um, and so things like that. Before you make a bikini out of a cool looking <laughs> fabric, you have to yeah. make yeah. sure you're not totally. appropriate. Yeah. One totally. of the things that hobbyists also doing is it's actually encouraging communities to to actually write their own stories um okay. put out their own information out there um a perfect example would be ifugao nation and um so they during this covid season they've been they put up a facebook page um and then they've had all these lectures and then they're also they also just published a book with uh 
um, Ifugao State University, I think. Um, and it talks about their patterns and then their traditions. Um, and 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 it's it's a it's a good way when when you get your information directly from the source. Um, right. Like um, even for me, I work with with a lot of communities. But when I go in, I always I always check myself because I always know that that I'm an outsider. Totally. Um, and and it's important to be respectful to to their traditions and and to to consult because. Um, in a way, because as an outsider, you, you buy something and you make it into something else. Um, a lot of things get lost in translation. Right. Um, and, and I think um, we all have to be a little bit more um, sensitive. Curious. Oh, curious yes, as well. Yeah. yeah. Curious right. and sensitive and just more aware. Um, you know, people that are really interested, I would suggest that they do visit the community. Um, that they're working with um, or that they're buying, purchasing from. So you can see the way they live and why certain textiles are so important or what can be modified. And that really has to come from the community. Um, and we're just, you know, we're just here to spread the word. But, uh, you know, the elders, they're the ones that we should really consult with and, and, um, and get all that information from. Right. And, and well, that said, though, like um, even somebody from the community, they they still have like um, I remember Teresa when we were doing um, when COVID started the, the um, Zhao of the blinds, he he had like sort of he had to defend this use of of their traditional textiles into into mass. So he had to have a conversation oh, with his elders. Okay. So. Right. That's why it's also that's also it's that important because right. um, they it really is it, it is something that's special to them and it's something that they hold sacred. And totally. They, right. And the Blaan situation also is similar with Tibali. So for some Tibalis, it might okay be okay to use a certain fabric a certain way, if, and for others, it isn't. So so who do you follow, right? Um, you, everyone needs to come to a consensus. And I guess because weaving and anything indigenous just exploded. It's like we're in, you know, the first, what, seven years of this and people finding out that, oh, we have so many indigenous groups pala. Okay, we have super culture pala, right? Like people did it, like, where is this from? <laughs> we're just, we're just starting. And right. all of us have to do our due diligence. All of us, it's, it's, a, it's work, but it's it's worth it because it's 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 Pinoy, right? Yeah. Right, right. Um, another thing I want to put, I want to say about cultural appropriation is it's not only the use of the textiles; it's also the use of the symbol, the symbol, the symbols, right. and then also the patterns. Because um, a lot of uh, a big bulk of cultural appropriation is when people get these patterns and they print it. Mm -hmm. on, oh, on okay. something else so that that that's the the biggest no no because that's sort of like intellectual property right you're stealing from them especially oh, okay. if you have no connection with the community when you're doing oh. that um so those are those are big issues that we also have to think about like how how do we give back to the communities when we use their patterns right. and their textiles like if it's textiles you're buying it so so they have a stake in, in in that sale but when you're taking something a symbol and putting it on like a t-shirt or mm -hmm. or even like a set of playing cards how do you give back to right. the community right um and that's something that 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 is still sort of like a question mark for a lot of people for right. myself included actually like how how do we really get past it it's huge just cultural appropriation Right. And before people say, how hard naman, I want na lang buy because parang ang daming gagawin. <laughs> Maybe so, tell us yeah. why we should all help and why we shouldn't give up on yeah. patronizing. So, uh, yeah. Habi will, um, hopefully, um, Habi will have items um, that we've, we've gotten, um, We've gotten weavers from all over the Philippines to weave. Um, at the moment, we only have we have twenty um, weavers who are weaving in Philippine cotton. We chose um, we chose patterns and textiles that are non-ritualistic and um, and not not 
part of their uh, religious practices, uh, mm -hmm. which is mostly like the malongs, um, the ordinary malongs, the the patajongs, um, things, um, patterns, um, and and weaves that they use for their daily life. Um, and I think that that would that's safe, right? To use, yeah. So if you stay within the confines, you know you're buying a safe. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, safe product. Yes. So even with all of the happy vendors, these are all vetted. They're all vetted, and then we check, double check, triple check, to see what kind of products they're producing and putting out in the market. Right. Is there a good way to know how? Because, like, for example, uh, our friend Kelly told me, you know, you're designer friend he's selling masks and he said they are indigenous but actually the fabric is from china so how does one know or how can you tell is there an easy way for the layman to find out or what's a simple way to be more wary <laughs> i think they're hand woven textiles if it's too good to be true if you're getting it like at 50 pesos <laughs> or something ready, because you'll find that in Divisoria and Ano. And it looks yeah. like hand-woven, but those are all machine-made. So they'll tell you, oh, that's from, from Mindanao, right? Because they know that you're not going to go there or whatever. Right. They'll tell you. So, I mean, you can tell for, if you've been buying from a certain person for some time, then then you can tell. But if not, you can always call us at Happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> for you. <laughs> We're flashing their contact yes. information yeah. below. And why should we all help? Why should we help preserve these traditions? Why should we patronize these products? Um, textiles and crafts are part of our Filipino identity. It's part of our identity. So, um, and it, in in these all have stories, and these. So we have to be. Again, wait, lam. <laughs> I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> we, have to be, <laughs> we have to be engaged i think um um i think it, it, it's part of our our journey of of being filipino um and knowing who we are um we should support them because these they will be gone if if we don't no um right. and and they're there are beautiful stories that can enrich our lives. Um, uh, the, the the cotton textiles are breathable and perfect for um, right. the, our tropical it's weather. Tropical weather. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, with, with our, you know, our textiles, we we're doing so many beautiful and creative things, and um, that are not done anywhere else. Right. We have, yeah. Pinya alone, right? You just talk about pinya. No one else does it. No one knows how to do it. Just even that embroidery, um, um, on, even on pinya, that's difficult. Pinya is very difficult to work with. Um, just that alone, right? And our indigenous communities, it's not about the tela naman eh. It's about right. pr preserving the culture that we have left, right? right. We, we have to remember that we were colonized and we have to remember that we're into Western things. We're into the right. Western culture and music and the language that, are, that we're speaking, right? So if if we don't patronize what we have, then who are we, right? Then we're just like another mall, right? Or another, you know. Right. So it, it, it's good. That patronize, help out, you know, help out yeah. your the people in the, in the country. Plus, you look pretty pa because our textiles are so <laughs> <laughs> so how to help um yeah. please shop at the um likang habi online market fair right. it's um will be on solid leaf on the 21st of october to the 27th and then we'll continue on after um we also would like to people to encourage people to become habi members um uh wherein you will have opportunity to um to be involved in the hobby events, um, right. join conferences, webinars, and summits about weaving and Filipino culture, um, as well as be able to volunteer for, for certain projects of hobby. So hobby is into education through our publications. Um, 
we also have, um, well, not now, but um, we usually have trips as well to visit weaving communities um, and to, so that we can all be enriched. Um, so joining um, Habi will also be something that you're investing in. Um, we would also encourage people to um, to donate or to support Habi projects. Right. Yes, of course. <laughs> so do so you have any products to entice us to shop for our show and tell? Uh, Charisse, you have some. Oh, <laughs> I have some, but they, they're, these are my products, but I can I just give you the list of all of the cool vendors? Sure, uh, sure. Okay, so we have 30 for for this, um, for the website. We have Abic Home and Culture. We have Aisha Original, Ancestral Crafts, of course, Beagle Sweetgrass Handicrafts. We have Camisa Amana, Coco and Tress, um, Creative Definitions. And they're doing really good work out of Negros, um, Patajongs and all of that. We have Dita Sandico, of course, who works with Abaca and Pina, um, Gift and Graces. We have La Herminia again, which is Pina. We have um, Local. We have Maria Angelica Rare Finds, Mana PH. Melograno, Melvidas, Monica Madrigal, Nardas, Pina Seda, Pinay, um, Raquel's Pina Cloth Products, Warungan, Sigrid Bangai Pottery. So this this year we have pottery as well, which which is really cool, right? Um, at the Deco Home, Silahis, um, uh, uh, TWWA, Uri, Woven Home Textiles, Ilocos Heritage. And of course, we have our Habi shop where you can find the books and the cotton fabric made um, by the different affiliated weavers. Uh, so yeah, I hope you can all, everyone's on Instagram. Habi is, we're just super active, like Instagramming all day and Facebooking <laughs> all day. Um, so yeah, we, we hope you could join us for this fair because it is something um, it is something very exciting and you're helping out your fellow weaver. Great. Thank you so much, Rambi and Cherie. Such an enlightening, educational and enriching hour. And good luck on the Habi Fair. Starts October 21 to 27. Yeah. Uh, shophabifair.com and follow them on Instagram at Habi Fair, Twitter at Likang Habi PH and on Facebook Happy the Philippine Textile Council. Okay. Can I plug one more thing? Two more yes, things. Yes, please. <laughs> um, part of the educational pro uh, program of Habi is we're, we're also supporting um, webinars and summits. So right. um, this Friday um, is the start of the Co-Trade Voices from the Field, um, which will be on, on, on Friday. Um, you can find the registration link on the, uh, on the Facebook pages. Um, of Habi Co-Trade and Manila Collectible. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. <laughs> on, um, so this is a, a three, four, three, three part a series. Three part webinar. Yes. Um, so it will be on the 16th, the 23rd. The 23rd of, and the 30th. Of October. Um, we also have, um, we're also supporting the Nayong Pilipino um, uh, Pamana, um, sorry, I have to get the, <laughs> um, so, sorry. Or follow the Facebook page for the complete yes. schedule. The, the, the Nayong Pilipino is a mga hibla ng pamana, a summit on weaving as an intangible cultural heritage. Um, their, their, their web, um, their registration, um, starts today and then they, they the first summit day will be on monday the 19th of october um we this is actually a great way to be more educated so you you go to the the webinars and then the summit so that you learn more and then come and shop in the hobby fair on the 21st yeah right. we have some questions here from our viewers from g rojas availability of dyeing materials in the area i wonder what area Okay, so, yeah. um, so, um, so, so, indigo is um is 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 something that um, uh, 
is being used now. Um, they're they're doing it in Ilocos and then in some parts of Mindanao. Um, it's a project that they're doing with um, PTRI. PTRI right. has actually put up a a a, dive, a dying facility in um, in Batangas. Um, right. But Indigo is 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 number one. Um, then um, each community has their own sort of berries and leaves that they use. Um, uh, Bark is also something that um, that people use for dye stuff. Um, then you have also the the older weavers. They're saying that like um, uh, green, you can use the 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 outer leaf of the piña for green. Um, it's uh, there's so much out there actually. Um, there hasn't been any um, uh, recent publication on 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 natural. Another has on natural dyes, but um, because before before the chemical dyes, um, the Philippines has already was already dyeing their their textiles as ikat is is the oldest um, weaving tradition right. in the Philippines. Right. Um, so it depends on the area. They have their own plants um, right. that they use. Indigo would be the most prevalent in 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 Luzon. Right. I guess. Uh, also from G, hope you don't mind my answering the why part of question number five. Number one, to support farmers and weavers and their families. Two, to sort of encourage them to continue what we're doing. And three, to preserve this part of our culture. Very well Thank said. You. Thank you, G. <laughs> so Pia says, are traditional textiles more eco-friendly than textiles we commonly see in the market? For example, the use of harmful chemicals, quantity of water used in production, etc. Um, if it's traditional textiles um, uh, that that was processed or made traditionally, then yes, yes. Um, because uh, because if they're using traditional dyes and then the traditional methods, Chemical. then then yes, it is. But not if it's an adaptation. It's 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 harder. Like um, they say that um, natural dyes, if you want it uh, to to keep and it's longer, isn't is, isn't as actually as um, eco friendly as using a, a chemical dye or an acid dye, because right. of um, the amount of water that you use um, to make it stay, and then the mordants that you use. Um, it it varies. Um, we try um, to work with communities that. Um, to help communities be more um, environmentally friendly, yeah, because they they also have to to do it to protect their own um, in their own place and their own environment. Because like die, the dyeing process, that's that's really something that you can pollute your water system and and then also harm um, the the ground <laughs> around you. So uh, right. Yeah. Right. Arlene answered G. Actually, in Aklan, we use leaves of talisay for black and gray color or yellow. And the bark of noni or sapang gives a dull red. Yes. So this um, noni um, is the kinarum. So that's the, the darkest brown. Um, that's also used with, uh, with the communities that we've uh, abaka. And sapan, sapan, um, is you can use the bark and that's the, the red that you see in the tinala. That's what they use for that. Right. Um, if you see, just a note about traditional dyes. If you see like, um, let's say tinala or, or certain abaca fabrics that are really vibrant in color, a lot of those are not all natural. That's already mixed with chemical dyes. So again, when you talk to the weaver, you can ask them and they'll let you know anyways. Right. From Robin Marie Sabalones. Following you from New York, can we purchase at the fair for shipment to the U.S.? Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, it will be an extra process. <laughs> Please bear with us. But yes, we will be. We will work to accommodate your orders. <laughs> but I hear also that your online shopping is... Uh, really hassle-free like after you order just expect it at your doorstep and you don't need to fuss with delivery is that right 
Yes, so that's automatic. You just input all of the information, just like ordering in any 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 um shopping website. Uh, we try right. to make it as seamless as possible, um, and uh, it within the Philippines setting. And if you want to ship to New York or anywhere, um, please also tell your friends to order. Well, we will ship that to you. Yeah, right. well. it will take some time. From Gabby Amazon, how do we become a happy member? Um. So you can go, at the moment, you can go to the Facebook page and the website. Um, we will have a special button for, um, for during the fair where you can um, become a member. Great. Thank you. Anything else you want to tell our viewers? Please invite them to the Happy Fair once again. So the Happy Fair, the, so this is the 10th. Like wow. Abbey Market yeah, Fair, um, and unfortunately, we are just going to be online this year. Um, but we will be live um, on at twelve midnight. Wow! Or, <laughs> twelve <laughs> twelve oh one on October twenty first. Yes. Right. All right. Thank you, Charisse and Ramby, and see you at the fair. Thank you. Thank you. All of you on the 21st. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. This has been Ask Ms. Mears, and I'll see you very soon. Bye.